Good morning, everyone. Can I just get, and see if you're awake at the first Sunday, just give me a hand clap for those who don't have a thing. All right. Good. You're awake. You're awake. Let's jump right in again. My name is Nathan Payne. A privilege to serve here as a pastor at Near North in the center region pastor, which if you're wondering what does center region mean, you'll find out in just a little bit. Well, when I was six or seven years old, uh, a, little, a little child in a small town in Indiana, uh, when my dad was in seminary, our family lived in kind of this space where it was a neighborhood where it wasn't densely populated, as you could imagine. And it was back in the 80s when, when you wanted to play with your friends, you'd go over to their house and we'd play in the dirt mounds and we'd ride our bikes and we'd do all sorts of things. And I remember having a, a friend particularly who uh, his family lived in just a few, uh, I don't even know if it was miles, it wasn't a mile, maybe half a mile or so away in a sort of a different neighborhood. And I remember being so excited to go over his house and play with him. And I rode my bike over there from my house to his. It was maybe the mid to late afternoon. And when I got there, uh, one of the things that was super exciting to me was they were going to watch Superman. Y'all ain't excited about Superman. I can see that. Now you have to understand this is back in the '80s, and I'm a I'm the the, the youngest of this uh, uh, four kids and this uh, uh, struggling financially black family in, in the middle of Indiana, and we didn't have TVs and VCRs, so they had this big old giant TV. It looked like to me it probably weighed like two two million pounds, but they're gonna watch Superman, and it was the one with Christopher Reeves, you know, back in the day, you know, where he saves the people with the helicopter and everything. And so I was like, man, I'm gonna watch Superman. So I'm watching Superman. I'm with my friends. My life is it's good, it's great, it's wonderful, until I kind of start to get that, like, that feeling. You know when you're a kid and it's like your parents are talking to you, but they're not there? Like, I should be home right now. And I'm looking out the window and it's like, man, it's gotten dark out there. And I'm supposed to be home. And, and so I get on my little blue bike and I start riding. I go up the street one way and then I go around a corner. I go up a hill, down a hill. And, and I'm riding and riding and riding and I'm realizing as the fear and the panic set in that I am lost. It's gotten dark and I can't see. I don't have vision to see where I, where I am and where I'm going and I don't know where I am and I'm starting to panic. I'm like terrified. I'm like scared. And, and I have to be honest with y'all, part of it was I was scared because I was lost and it was dark and I was a black man, a uh, black boy in the middle of Indiana. But, but I was even more afraid because I had to go home to a black mama. <laughs> Whatever was out there was going to be much easier than what was going to happen when I got home. <laughs> But the reality was that I was lost, that I had lost vision. I didn't have vision to where I was going, so I couldn't figure out which way to go. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about our vision as a church, who we are and where we are going together this morning. I mean, working through our vision statement and breaking that apart as we think about what that means for who we are as Park Community Church and where God is calling us to go on the cusp of this new year as we head into this new decade. Notice here in uh, Proverbs 29, many of you may be familiar with this verse. It says, where there's no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. And the fact is that all of us need something to help us keep direction. That as life goes on and things happen, as things change, looking at 2019 and everything that was thrown your way, we all need recalibration and understanding of where we're headed and how to get there. We need the vision. And as a church, we have a vision statement that's rooted in the gospel, rooted in the scripture, and we're going to break that apart. Let me read it for us. It says this, we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives, renews the city, and impacts the world. That's our vision and that's our direction. That's where we are headed as a church. And I, I hope that it will matter for you as you think about what is the part that you will play in what God has called us to as a church. Before we jump in, let me pray. God, we invite you here as has already been prayed that your Holy Spirit would have his way in our hearts and lives, that you would speak, that you would direct, you would guide us, you would give us a vision for what you've called us to and how we play a part in it. 
Do it not for our glory, but for yours, Jesus. Do it for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first part of our vision statement says that we exist. Uh, We exist. Uh, And let's ask ourselves, what does this mean for us to exist as a church? What is it talking about? Who are we as Park Community Church? Well, I want to remind us that the church, broadly speaking, means all followers of Jesus. Big C Church, if you will. All followers of Jesus across the globe, across all time. And we see in 1 Peter 2, it says that talking about all believers, all followers of Jesus, that you are a royal priesthood, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Notice, who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That as followers of Jesus, we have been called out of the darkness and brought into the light and been brought into this new community of people that are now called the church. But the reality is that the big C church is organized around smaller communities, smaller communities of people known as local churches. And we gather together, we live life together and live out proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us into his marvelous light. And that's what it means for us to exist as a local church, that Park Community Church exists as a local group of believers who have been called out of darkness into the light, not by what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. And some of you may not know this, but uh, this location where we are here right now as we're in this space that we're just one of several churches that have been planted by Park that are part of Park Community Church as a whole. Here's a map of it. If you can look on this screen, you'll see that there are Park churches all throughout the city from the south all the way to the north. And while the language can be tricky, one of the ways that we have sensed to be able to describe who we are is that we as Park Community Church are a family of interdependent churches, a family of interdependent churches who are united around a vision together. You'll see that we have different regions where we have a north region, a center region of which you are a part of, the near north location and the Lincoln Park location, and then the near south region. And the thing that unites us is our vision, our shared vision together. It's the thing that drives us and moves us and motivates us together to do what God has called us to do. We exist, Park Community Church. We exist to be a biblical community, a biblical community. And what does that mean for us? What does it mean for us to be a biblical community? Well, it, first of all, it means that the, the scripture, the Bible is the foundation of everything that we do as a church. And the reason is that we believe that the Bible is God's word, that it's his very exhale of God, the, the word of God spoken to us, these 66 books that are gathered together that shape us and continue to guide us. I love what Second Timothy says about God's word, that all scripture, notice all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The very words of God that shape everything about who we are. It shapes how we date. It shapes how we spend our money. It shapes how we parent our children. It shapes how we engage with people at work. It shapes how we share our faith with our neighbors. And that's why when you gather, if you're at any of our gatherings, the thing that shapes our gatherings is, and that enriches our gatherings is, is the word of God. So the primary ways that we gather as a church is that we gather on weekends and gatherings just like this in our services. And then we also gather throughout the week in our small groups. In our services, we gather and we sing and rehearse the truths of who God is shaped by what the scripture has revealed as we pray, as we are led by and we are taught by what is guided by the scripture. And then we come throughout the week and meet together in small groups 
which are spaces for us to be equipped and encouraged to encounter God, to exhibit Christ-likeness and to be empowered for mission, that a place to go deeper relationally that you can't get by just simply sitting in a service to develop those relationships, get more connected, but then to also be transformed by the power of God's word. I know for me personally, early in our marriage, I can remember when we had our first child and uh, it was a time where if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. When you have your first baby, you're like, the only thing I want is sleep. Uh, I will pay you for sleep. Uh, I mean, like, hey, this is a this side business. If you want to make a little money, just go to a parent of a first time, first time parent say, hey, I'll watch your kids so you can sleep. And it was a time where uh, we had to make a decision whether or not to be in small group community or not. It was inconvenient. It cost us something. We had to figure out the sleep schedule, nap schedule for our child and how to work around that with our firstborn. And I remember very specifically this one moment in our relationship, in our marriage relationship with this firstborn child, little sleep and, 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 and new dad and the frustrations. And, and I remember having this big argument and blow up between me and my wife and, and we were in small group. And if you've been in a small group uh, where you have relationship with people, we show up and, you know, we're going to open God's word and, you know, pretend you know, <laughs> that everything's great. You're like, we see through that. Brother, you can't hide nothing. The entire small group literally just turns and says, what's wrong? And I remember at that moment on the 4800 block west, uh, uh, it's like West Cicero, and I remember particularly sharing what had happened between me and my wife and that small group came alongside us and what could have been the beginning of a massive rift in our marriage was something that God used to weave our hearts together in the context of that community. That's just one example from my life. I'm sure you have many more. To be in biblical community means that we're gathered together on mission together. And I want to encourage you, if you're not part of a small group, Lisa mentioned it already next week after 11 a.m. service, you gather for that, get together with that small group, connect to find out more what that would look like so you can get a taste of what it would be like to be in community. You need to do that. We have to do that. Let's go further in our vision statement. We exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms Lives, reduce the city, and impacts the world. I want to focus on where the gospel of Jesus Christ, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's, if you look at our vision statement, you'll notice that uh, the thing that is causing the action of transformation, renewal, and impact is the gospel. You'll notice that our focus is not on us making it happen, but the gospel. And the gospel is not the thing that just gets us into God's kingdom. It's the thing that teaches us and empowers us to live according to it. It's the engine of everything we are and everything we do as a church. What is the gospel if we were to summarize it? This might be helpful if you look at this slide here. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. We believe that God, God the Father, Holy Spirit, and the God the Son, that the triune God as revealed in the Bible, that he created everything in existence. And at first, everything was good. Everything was all good. Relationship with God was unhindered. Relationship with mankind and himself was unhindered. And the stewardship of creation for God's glory, there was nothing wrong whatsoever. And yet, the fall happens. And what is the fall? The falling is when humanity, mankind, rebels against God and says, no, instead of you being God, we want to be God. We want to be masters of our own destiny. And in doing so, we result in sin results and brokenness enters the world. Brokenness enters into relationship with God. Brokenness enters into relationship with mankind and himself and with creation. Sickness and death enters the world. Decay and everything wrong with the world as we know it starts at the moment that we want to be God. And God could have in that moment said, you chose, you're going to get what you deserve. But no, what does he do? God says, no, 
I'm going to actually come. I'm going to embody myself in the form of a baby and come and take uh, on humanity's sinfulness on myself. I'm going to live a perfect life and then pay the penalty that they deserve and give them my righteousness and die on the cross and be raised from the dead so that I can offer them new life. That's redemption. And the story goes that not only is the gospel, the good news of Jesus coming to die and for our sins and be raised from the dead, but that he will return and one day he will make everything right that has been made wrong. The gospel is the good news and it's the thing that animates and motivates and is the engine of all that we are and all that we do. I love what Paul says about it. Paul, a follower of Jesus, as he writes to a church in the city of Rome, and Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of God. He goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the power to transform every life. The gospel is the thing that is the catalyst, the engine. It's the thing that will bring us into the kingdom and continue to transform us as we're part of God's mission in the world. Let's look at that second, the, our next part of our vision statement. The gospel of Jesus Christ, notice transforms lives. We believe as a church that the gospel has power. It's the power to break down our walls of pride. It has the power to, to, to heal the brokenness within each of us. It's the power to bring life where there was death to everyone who believe. And that's why every single story in this room, whatever you have brought into this space, that's why your story matters. That's why every story in the context of your relationships and the workplace that you work in or the school you go to or the neighborhood you live in, that's why every one of those stories matters. Because every person is not a project but a person to love with the gospel. Reminds me of a young man. His name is Nate Burton. You see Nate right here, and many of you, if you had walked past Nate on the streets of Chicago, you just think he's just another guy from the city. Nate used to run on the streets pretty hard. He was one of those people that you would expect to land in the same place that the statistics would promote or suggest he would, dead or in jail. And yet, some of you from our church in relationship with Nate shared the gospel with him and his life was radically changed as he trusted in Jesus, as he left the life of the streets. He he was one of those guys who was always digging into God's word. If you were to look in his Bibles, you'd see notes that he'd written about how God was speaking to him and changing him and transforming him. He was working at a company alongside some folks from Park, living a life that, that, that defied the trajectory of what his life in our city would say he would live. And Nate was a faithful member of Park Community Church. Well, sadly, Nate unexpectedly passed away this summer. And I can recall being right in this space where his funeral was held as the the transforming work of the gospel in his life had sent waves throughout his neighborhood, waves throughout his family and friends and those who used to know the old Nate as they stood there. I can remember seeing this group of guys who who were running from the streets and who, who, who knew that Nate's life had been transformed as his life being transformed by the gospel would send shock waves. His life and legacy lives on. He'd been transformed by the gospel. That's why as a church, I want to challenge each and every one of us this year in 2020 to be thinking and praying for at least one person, at least one. You can call it your one, or you maybe you have three or four people in your life who presently don't know Jesus, who, whose lives have not been transformed by the gospel yet. I want to challenge you to love them just as God loves them, to engage with them, and to share the good news 
with them. I'm also excited for this coming year for some things we have in store to help equip you to share your faith and engage in with others who don't know Jesus. But one uh, one resource that you might want to note is the Alpha Course, and it's just a space that you can bring your friends to, your neighbor to, your coworker to, to learn how to engage in the questions of life that people are asking and they might be asking. And it will equip you, but also give them an opportunity to wrestle with those questions. And perhaps they would, in that space, come to know and experience the transforming work of the gospel. Because here's the reality. The bottom line is this. When your life has been transformed by the gospel, you can't help but want to see other lives being transformed by the gospel. That as the good news has changed us and is changing us, we want others to experience that. The acceptance and joy of being known and loved unconditionally by a God who has pursued us. We want others to experience that freedom from anxiety and worry and be able to turn our hearts and lives to look and serve others. We want others to be caught up in that greater mission and story of God's mission in the world. And as a church, we've had the privilege to see this happen over this past year, to see 100 folks from all of our locations across Park Community Church, to see almost 100 people get baptized. This is 60 folks, folks from this region alone, 60 of those folks, kids, teenagers, young adults, married folks, single folks. 100 people are publicly declaring that their life has been transformed by the gospel. And let me just say that we as a church will stand here with conviction that it is not because we are clever, it's not because we have the best resources or the best people. The reality is that the thing that animates and motivates and moves and transforms the lives of people is the gospel. And the gospel not only transforms us, but it's that same gospel that then sends us out to others. Notice what Jesus says Matthew 28 says, go therefore and make disciples. In John 20, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. That means that all of us whose lives have been transformed by the gospel, that we have been called to go make disciples, that every single one of us who have been transformed by the gospel has been sent. All of us have been called and commanded to love one another. And I have to ask you on the cusp of this new year and the decade ahead of us, Park, what are you doing with that calling? Looking further at our vision statement, exists to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives and notice renews the city. Oh, there's a couple things I want you to think about what the gospel, about what renewing the city means. First of all, the word city appears in the Bible over 700 times. Not just cities themselves, but the word city itself. And it's a place where God has revealed himself to people, making himself known to people, regardless of that particular city's reputation. Think about the book of Jonah, the story where Jonah is told by God to go to this city, Nineveh, and preach against it because its wickedness has come up against me. Now, if you're like me and have a religious background, you're like, yeah, God was telling him to go to them so he could throw some fire in hell on them and crush them. They're some bad people. That might be our sort of sense of that's why God was going to send Jonah. But if you read that storyline, God is sending Jonah to this people, to this city, because he wants them to respond in repentance so they can have relationship with him. A revival breaks out, and, and, and God is, it reveals his heart for this city as Jonah is upset that people turn to God, and, and, and God says, look, Jonah, Jonah 4.11, Jonah, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? God is saying, Jonah, look, I care about this city. In this city, there's 120,000 people who are spiritually ignorant, who don't even know what to do. I even care about the economy, the cattle, because it affects the people who live in that city. Look at Jeremiah 29. If we were to open that passage, we'd see where the people of God have been exiled into the city of Babylon, and God says to them, hey, don't stay on the outskirts of the city. 
Go into the city, seek its peace, be all in. Be where they're at, feel what they feel, suffer what they suffer, and pray continually for it because if it prospers, you'll prosper too. Notice what else the scripture reveals about cities. The New Testament as the gospel is radically transforming the lives of people in the book of Acts. Cities become the basis for the missional strategy of the gospel exploding. A lot is said about how in that early community of believers in Acts chapter 2 where they, their lives are transformed, they're in community together. They were a biblical community as they were hearing the word of God. They were caring for one another. It was a rich and incredible time. But the book of Acts is not simply about them huddled together. It's about the movement of the gospel out into the world. You see how in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul, follower of Jesus, is connected as he goes to 60 different cities in nine different provinces across the world, planting 20 or so churches, and that's not even counting the one that those he had mentored would plant. You see that in this movement in the book of Acts, that wherever the gospel lands, that it explodes and moves out. And in these cities, they're messy places. You can find that because you can read the letters that Paul wrote to them, and many of them in the New Testament are letters to churches in cities, and they're messy people, they're messy places with messy people, rather. But that's where God does some of his best work. That's why we believe God is doing some of his best work right here in Chicago as well. That's why we're committed to its renewal. Yes, this city is challenging. Yes, Yes, it has its difficulties. You know, the old prophet says that mo money, mo problems. A new prophet says, no, it's mo people, mo problems. And God has called us here. What's some other things for us to think about when we think about cities? And why is it important for Park Community Church to be present? Well, here's some facts that you need to know about. One is for the first time in the history of the world, over half of the world's population now lives in cities. Every month, five million people move into the cities of the world. Five million people is two, uh, roughly two times the population of Chicago moving into cities across the world, and we need to be prepared to engage with the world that is and the world that will be. Secondly, Cities are key centers of influence. It's where new ideas come from and form the way people think, where government and education and the arts and finance and culture are most influential, and this is where the gospel can have the most influence. I mean, some cities are even more influential than entire countries. Look at Chicago's influence, for example, on the educational space and the financial space. Chicago is projected in the next 10 to 15 years to have a gross domestic product of $1 trillion. That's more than some countries. We also need to be present in the city because we want to reach the next generation with the gospel. We have to be in the city because that's where folks are moving to. Uh, for education, for work seeking to make a mark on the world. I mean, just uh, a couple years ago, the Lakeview neighborhood, uh, which is not far from here, became the most populated neighborhood in Chicago with around 100,000 people, average age of 32 years old. If we want to reach the next generation, we have got to be engaged in the city. Folks aren't saying, I just finished grad, I just finished grad school, I just finished undergrad. I'm going to move to Naperville. How many of y'all said that? Like, I want to move to the burbs. Like, no, nah, I'm going to move in the city, man. Move back home with my parents. Uh-uh. Nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with Naperville. <laughs> God loves everybody, I guess. <laughs> Why else is the city important to us? It's where we have to be if we want to reach the poor the orphan, the widow, the immigrant, all of whom are a big deal in God's mission throughout scripture. And the city is where many and most of those folks are. And frankly, if you're sitting here this morning, I have to tell you that you're a part of that mission. 
But what's going to hold us back, Park? What will hold us back from fully engaging with that mission to engage the city? I think there's two dangers for us to think about. One is assimilation. The other is indifference. The first is assimilation, and that's when we, uh, we come to the city with the idea of pursuing it as an urban theme park, as Harvard economics professor Edward Glacier says, that we look at the city as a place to enjoy and do things that give us what we want, but we don't look at it as a place to engage with our gifts and our abilities. We consume the city. But there's another way that we might assimilate is when we jump into the rat race pursuing our own interests at whatever cost to us or others as we seek our own fulfillment. That will make us ineffective in this city. I think there's a danger that perhaps is maybe even far greater for us and that's the danger to be indifferent. To have the mentality of the city that I'm just here for a season, for a couple years, you know, so maybe I'll just go to church a couple times a month and, you know, when I graduate from college, I'll head out to where I want to go or once I finish my graduate degree, I'm out of here or once I get that promotion and get paid a little bit more, I can buy the house that I want in Naperville or somewhere else or I can go to my next adventure and move to the next city I want to be in. I want to be in Denver. I want to be in Austin. I want to be in Nashville. I want to be in Charlotte. I just don't want to be here. Now, I just have to say, there's nothing wrong with moving to Nashville, Naperville, Denver, Austin. If you're moving there, God bless you. And I've had those conversations with those who are making that move, because sometimes that move is your next right step. But come on, y'all, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we're unwilling to ask the question, God, are you calling me to use what you have given me to be on mission in this city with this people for the long haul? I mean, do we have this sense of calling to a people and to a place? That's why seven years ago, a group of people, 20 or so people who moved from the Lincoln Park neighborhood on the, up to the north side of the city to a part of the city, Rogers Park, where Park was not located and where there wasn't a strong gospel witness. They left their easier commute for home. They left a, a, an easier way to get to work, to go to a harder place to get to work. And uh, they, they went from a place where they were known in a community of things that were predictable and safe to go to a neighborhood to see the gospel expand in the lives of people to see the city renewed it's a vibrant location one of our park churches that's doing some great work there we want to see the city renewed that's why many of us have bought homes and settled gospel roots into the city so we can love our neighbors as ourselves that's why in just a couple days on wednesday night our 312 ministry is hosting a gathering a panel discussion to talk about concrete ways for people to love and serve the people of our city that's why we do that because we want to see the city renewed and i love that word renew because it means to bring new life there's a couple ways that we've gone about this as a church. One is that we have a nonprofit organization called Renew Chicago, and it focuses on the larger systemic issues within our city, economic impact and schools, educational issues, and we partner with local organizations across the city like GRIP, By the Hand, You Are Chicago, Breakthrough Ministries, World Relief, and Pacific Garden Mission, just to name a few. It's why we cross park, park churches in the city. We are engaged with a local Local schools like Armour Elementary on the south side and Ogden Jenner right here in this neighborhood and Taft High School on the far northwest side of the city. That's why we recently had the privilege to open up a adoption fund under the guys under under the umbrella of Renew Chicago to provide financial support for park members who are in the process of adoption as we seek to engage the vulnerable kids in our city and beyond. So Renew Chicago is one way we get after renewing the city. But secondly, we also believe city renewal happens when we are engaging with seeing gospel-centered, gospel-preaching churches planted in neighborhoods. The Great Commission, 
Remember, Jesus says, go and make disciples. Look at verse 20, though. He says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And you can only accomplish that through ongoing participation in healthy gospel preaching churches. As a church, we've had the privilege to see seven park churches across the city. And you'll see a slide here that shows that we have these locations, Forest Glen, Nord Park, Rogers Park, Lincoln Park, Near North, South Loop, and Bridgeport. And those are there because 12 years ago, the elders, when this facility was purchased and renovated, said, no, we're not going to just all huddle together and stay in one place. We want to go where the people are, just like how Jesus came to where we were. We want to play in the same playgrounds. We want to shop at the same grocery stores and drive over the same potholes as everybody else. So we believe the gospel movement doesn't just stop with us. And our vision for city renewal is to see flourishing gospel preaching churches in every neighborhood of Chicago. Now we know we can't do that on our own. That's why we partner with church planning networks in the city. Two of them are the Chicago Partnership and a New Thing Network. And we partner with these networks that are made up of gospel preaching churches in the city and in the Chicago area who don't look like us, who have different cultures than us because they are committed to seeing churches planted in the city and they can help us together as we link together financially with resources and training and people that we can see more churches planted throughout our city more quickly and in a diversity of neighborhoods than we could do on our own. That's why we do that. I want to show you this map of a church plant. Some of you have seen this before, but this represents where park church locations are all in the teal dots. And then the white dots represent church plants that we've been a part of helping see come into reality. You'll notice that there's far more white dots than there are teal dots. And I just have to say, this is not how you build your brand. The Park Community Church is not trying to build a brand. We are not a business trying to open up franchises. We are part of the kingdom of God. And and, and frankly, we don't care. I don't care who gets the credit because the only name that's going to last for all eternity, the only name that's going to be praised is not going to be Park Community Church. There's one name that's going to be praised, and his name is Jesus. You can clap to that. I'll say it again. Park Community Church, we are not about Park Community Church. We are about the name of Jesus. It's all about him. Let's go further in this vision statement. It says we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives, renews the city, and impacts the world. Y'all, our God is a global God. That verse that all of us are, many of us are familiar with, it says, for God so loved the, he loved the world. We just celebrated Christmas that, that reminds us that Jesus was sent to fulfill God's mission to save the world for all who would trust in him. And I want to remind us of Revelation 7. And it says this, look, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. Notice this, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, Jesus. And what are they saying? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Heaven, and that's the place where all the nations are going to be gathered. We'll be praising God forever. Heaven's going to be multi-ethnic, multicultural, multilinguistic. It's going to be multi-everything, a beautiful picture of God's redeeming grace, God's redeeming power. And who does he call to help bring that reality into reality? You, me, us, the local church, Park Community Church. I want you to look at this photo here. This is a photo of some folks who are part of Park Community Church reminding you that we are located all throughout the city and this is a, one of the gatherings and these are some of your brothers and sisters, y'all, who's in this picture. 
What you wouldn't know is that there's a young la- there's a lady in this picture who was raised in India as a Hindu, a brother who was raised in India who has a heritage of his dad being a pastor who's now here serving in Chicago. There's two former Muslims that are part of this gathering who are one from Afghanistan, the other from Iran, standing together in prayer, worshiping Jesus. That's who we are as a church, y'all. And Jesus commands us to bring his good news, the gospel to every person in our sphere, to bring the gospel to our neighbors, to bring the gospel to our coworkers, our friends, our teammates, and to the people that he has brought to this city. But he doesn't just call us to this city. He's called us to the people and places where the gospel has not yet been proclaimed. Look at Acts 1.8. You receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Just to remind you, it's not about power that you have in yourself. It's the power that he gives us. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Yeah, that's our neighbors. That's our friends, our coworkers in Judea and Samaria. And to the end of the earth, our God's a global God. And you know what that means. That means that Park Community Church is a global church. That means that every follower of Jesus is a global follower of Jesus, that either we are preparing to go take his name to places that have not been proclaimed, or we are helping others to go. Folks, let me tell you this morning, there are no third options. We have a bold vision to see 100 people from our seats being sent out to those who have not heard the God, the good news of the gospel, people like you. People like me. I'm so grateful that part of this storyline of what God has done in our vision is that our own lead pastor, former lead pastor, Jackson Crum and his wife Donna are two people who are going to be part of that number as they head out in the next several months to the other side of the world. I say again, there are no third options that either we are preparing to go or we're helping others to go. And every one of us has a role in that. Whether we're one of those folks as a global-minded follower of Jesus that we come alongside and pray for those who are going, support them financially, get their updates and engage with them or uh, any sort of way that we have been called to be part of that mission. Even if we're not gonna move overseas, we're either going or sending. I want to encourage you that this Thursday you can come and meet some of those folks who are heading out this year to hear more of their story and where God is taking them right here in Park Cafe. See, we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives, renews the city, and impacts the world. This is who we are as a church and what we believe God is calling us to. And so here's the question for you this morning. What role are you going to play in this? As a church, we want you to be a part of this mission and what God is doing. We want you to join and link arms with us in this vision to go all in, not to just simply come to services and sit and, ex- and kind of be a spectator watching what happens, but to be part of what God is doing, to link arms with us in membership, meaning that you're going to take on responsibility and service and leadership and sacrifice and accountability. Because let me remind you, God has not saved us to keep us safe. He has saved us to be on mission with him to together. So let me ask you this as we head into 2020. As the remaining part of this year is before us, as this decade is ahead of us, what are you going to give yourself to? I invite you to be part of what God is doing here, to be part of this vision at Park Community Church, where we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives, renews the city, and impacts the world. Let me show you a video of those, some stories of some folks just like you who are living this out.